premonition or what, but I was real excited about it. I thought it was a mega find. That's what I called my dad and told him it was a mega find. And he thought, he said, oh, it's probably just some old cow bones. He didn't have faith in me. Jack Horner did, and Kathy Wankel's T-Rex has become the latest star exhibit at the Museum of the Rockies. Good amateur paleontologists are extremely important. Uh, there are only a few of us paleontologists in Montana, and, and the state is 600 miles long and 400 miles wide, and there are lots and lots of areas that have good fossils in them so eyes out looking for us are what we need in fact in our museum we have six or seven uh, big exhibits and all of the specimens we have were found by amateurs the important thing is that the amateur bring it to the museum rather than take it home and put it in his garage how did you first get interested in dinosaur bones Oh, I think it dates back to the uranium days when um, we were prospecting for uranium. I found this big uh, humerus, that's the upper arm bone, and uh, it's now in the Smithsonian, but finding this big bone kind of set us off on that. Uh, uh, I've been looking around this quarry, for instance, and it looks to me like bones look like rocks. I don't know how an amateur would ever tell one from a rock. Uh, bones do look like rocks, and, and you have to learn how to uh, distinguish a rock, a bone has cell structure, just like our bones in our body, you know, we have cell structure. Wood has grain, um, so I look for that cell structure, and it's there if you look for it. You, and it's just like anything else, you learn to know what you're looking but for. But you can see that just with the naked eye as you walk across a bunch yes, of rock? Yes, after a while. Mm -hmm. Vivian Jones has walked these hills of Colorado for 40 years. Her numerous discoveries have helped dinosaur Jim Jensen uncover some major finds. How did you discover this particular site? Well, I was uh, looking over this little opening on this hillside, and I found this very strange shape bone, and I did not know what it was, so I decided to take it home and put it up until I saw Jim the next time to get it identified. What were you doing with them? Well, at first we were just kind of storing them, not knowing what to do with them, and then Jim came by, and he was our savior. <laughs> In what it, sense was he your well, savior? Well, he just asked us if we would uh, work with him, if we were to find anything, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we were more than happy to, to do that. And as a result of that, they made a tremendous contribution to science, actually, because of the finds they made, I was able to open up four quarries in these mountains and recover the most new dinosaurs that anyone's ever found. Today, chance discoveries are being helped by science. Dinosaur hunters use technology to detect what the eye cannot see. That's the theory, anyway. In practice, finding dinosaurs is still, shall we say, a hit-and-miss affair. Got a misfire, wait a minute. Rowan, you know it's all your fault that we got involved in all this confusion. Now, wait here. a minute. You led me on by saying paleontology was in the dark ages and we needed to do some real science. Well, that we were in the dark ages then, and I think we still are. Ready? I'm ready, arm it. Ready? Uh, seriously, this all began when I uh, gave a seminar at Los Alamos and challenged scientists like Roland and others here uh, into helping us conduct this excavation. The specific problem that I posed was, can we see the bones in the ground before we excavate them? And the reason I needed to know the answers was that we had 10 feet of rock to remove before we could get down to bone level if this skeleton were to continue into the hill the way we projected. Okay, Cliff, show us some bones here. What do you got? Time will tell whether high tech can reveal all about this particular dinosaur. It's called Seismosaurus, and it may turn out to be the biggest dinosaur ever. But that's not all. The bones found so far are in the same position they had in life, articulated. And that's a crucial lead for dinosaur detectives. Probably the most important feature about this skeleton is the fact that it's articulated. Uh, the reason we like to have articulated skeletons is that it allows us to know exact positions for each bone. And that's important in our, in our descriptions and analytical work. In this case, the articulation is also important because we have a series of stomach stones that were found 
in direct association with the bones, like the stones in this circle, which are the gastroliths that were used for grinding food, they represent the substitute for teeth. In the sauropod dinosaurs, the teeth were about the size of my finger. They couldn't grind food. Instead, all they could do was rake food off the vegetation. And there was no grinding mechanism at all in the jaws. The only capacity for processing food mechanically was with gastroliths, grinding in a grinding mill so that the food would be crushed and processed, readied for chemical digestion in the stomach. And it's a fair estimate to say that uh, they ate around a ton, or 2,000 pounds of food in a day. They processed that much plant material. Like any scientific investigation, there's always a wild card. The wild card in our study is the occurrence of this gastrolith, which is so much larger than elsewhere. We were astonished. This one weighs over two pounds, and it's five or six times larger than this one. One idea we have is that perhaps this was the one that caused the extinction of this individual when he choked to death. However that seismosaurus died, giants like him survived generation after generation for 130 million years. But how did they manage to survive for so long? Um, in fact, all dinosaurs would fit in the same size range as our known range of living and fossil mammals. So the question really ought to be, why aren't more mammals dinosaur size? Because they certainly can get to be that big. Well, I think it's something to do with the difference in reproduction between mammals and dinosaurs. Large mammals, like elephants, only have one young every three or four years, whereas dinosaurs we know could lay you know, 20 eggs at a go and may have bred more often. As the Ice Ages, the large mammals were the ones that went out, probably because when they had um, a bad winter or something, and many of them died, they couldn't rapidly rebuild their populations. Now, a dinosaur laying 20 eggs, sure, under most conditions, most of the young would die, but it would mean they had the capacity to rebuild populations quickly, which would be impossible for a mammal. Today, those dinosaur corpses have brought a not always welcome new enterprise. For hard on the heels of the amateurs has come a new gold rush. Professional dinosaur hunters like Peter Larson walk a thin line between making money out of dinosaur finds and scientific research. Well, there is a bit of a controversy about being able to actually sell dinosaur bones. Um, actually, this is the way, a way that I've found to be able to do what I want with my life. Those of us who work in this company have a real commitment to science it's, it's our thing. We, we not only supply specimens, dinosaurs, to museums who otherwise would not be able to afford to get them, but perhaps places like uh, Japan, which really has no dinosaur skeletons. The only way they can see a real dinosaur is to buy one. And uh, those ch the children who live in Japan have just as much right to see a dinosaur as the children who live here in the United States. And here we have an abundance of dinosaurs, and we can supply dinosaurs to those museums where they otherwise would not be able to have them. In the summer of 1990, Peter Larson came up with the find of his life. Well, this turns out to be the largest Tyrannosaurus that has ever been found. We kind of like to name our, our fossils when we find them to give them sort of a personality. It was found by Susan Hendrickson, so we came up with the name Sue. Sue is going to be the cornerstone of our museum, which we've been working on, in fact, which I've been dreaming of since I was a little kid and Sue will be mounted in Hill City, South Dakota in our new museum. Although Larson didn't know it at the time, Sue may be a fitting name for this, the largest Tyrannosaur ever. Its size probably meant that Sue was a female and more than able to stand her ground against a smaller male. She needed to be larger to nurture the eggs inside her. Such new information is grist to the mill for amateur dinosaur enthusiasts. 